Welcome to One Question with me, Mr. Sharp. I am so excited to have nonfiction expert, author extraordinaire, Melissa Stewart on the show today. Are you ready? Let's go. If you're looking for videos to get kids excited about reading and tips for the classroom, this is the place for you. Click that subscribe button down below. If you click that bell, you'll get an email every time I post a new video. Melissa Stewart has been writing these really amazing blog posts for teachers on how to use nonfiction text in the classroom and how to get kids to understand the different types of nonfiction text in the classroom. And it blew my mind. My mind is blown. I got to thinking, this is great and this is wonderful. I just wanted to know what Melissa thought about why kids needed to know the different types of nonfiction texts. Why do they need to know what they are? I think that what Melissa had to say is gonna help all educators really think deeply about how we're using nonfiction texts and some things that we can do to help kids understand nonfiction text even better. So Melissa, why is it important for kids to know the five different types of nonfiction text? Thanks for your question, Mr. Sharp. The reason that understanding the five categories of nonfiction and learning to classify books in this way can be useful to students is that it can help them learn to predict the kind of information that they're likely to find in that book and also how they can access it, how that information will be presented. It can also help them learn to identify the kinds of nonfiction books that they enjoy reading the most. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the five different categories. They are active, browsable, traditional, expository literature, and narrative. Back when we were kids, there was just one kind of nonfiction, traditional nonfiction. And these were books, they were survey books, they looked at broad topics, they were general introductions, and they told you all, oops, they told you all about a topic. And so they have an expository writing style that explains, describes, or informs. They have clear, concise language, and they, ha they have a description text structure most, most of the time. Here's another example. This is for a slightly younger audience. In the early 1990s, the nonfiction world was really kind of shaken up when Dorling Kindersley introduced their eyewitness book series. And so suddenly nonfiction was being presented in a whole new way. Instead of reading from page to page and spread to spread, there are lots of little bits of information. And there's also beautiful design, big bold pictures. And so it's a whole different way of getting that information. So if students are writing a nonfiction report and they want to just kind of get the lay of the land, they want to just kind of read around their topic, a traditional book can be a great place to start. But then when they focus in on their topic and they decide that they need more specific information, they can use the um, table of contents and the index in books like this to try to get the specific information that they're looking for. So these books have uh, also have an expository writing style, so the main difference is the way that the information is being presented. In the mid-1990s, nonfiction authors started to experiment with narrative nonfiction. This is a kind of nonfiction that started in the adult world in the 19, probably the 1970s, and eventually um, children's book authors started experimenting with it as well. So all the wonderful picture book biographies and also middle grade and young adult biographies being published today are narrative nonfiction. And so they tell a story. They tell a true story or convey an experience. And the reason that these books are so appealing to people who gravitate toward fiction is because they have all the, all the same things that you would expect to find in a fiction book. They have uh, real characters, they have settings, often they have dialogue, they have um, often an, a narrative arc. And so these books feel familiar and comfortable to fiction lovers. Uh, these books are especially good for biographies and for books that his, his, uh, recount historical events, but they can also be other kinds of books too. So this is what I would call a journey narrative where the author uh, goes on a trip with some scientists may, who are making discoveries at the time, and she sort of takes you along for the journey. Also, 
there can be animal life stories. In addition to human life stories, there can be animal life stories, and so this is one example of that. Recently, some people have fallen into the habit of calling any nonfiction book that has rich, engaging language narrative nonfiction, but actually some of those books are better categorized as expository literature. So expository literature has an expository writing style. It explains, it forms, or describes. It doesn't tell a story, but it also has rich, engaging language. It often has a strong voice. Um, it can have pretty much any text structure that you can think of. It often has an innovative format. So Steve Jenkins is pretty much the father of expository literature. All his wonderful books are good examples of that. Here's uh, one that I really love. This has a humorous writing style. These books are especially good for discussing STEM processes or STEM concepts. Here's another book that has a very different voice. This is more kind of a wondrous lyrical voice. And there are some social studies books in this category, and here's one example. This also has a really wonderful humorous voice. So most of these books are in the sciences, but there are some that are in other areas too. And so if you have kids that you think like expository writing better, but really are, are kind of history buffs, this is a book that would work really well for them. And then the final category is active nonfiction. And this is a name that comes from the bookseller community. And so these are sort of an offshoot of browsable books that they also have a really great um, design and you're kind of just grabbing bits of information as you need it. You're not necessarily reading it cover to cover. But these are books that are they're either highly interactive or they're helping kids to learn to do some activity that they're really interested in. So these could be how-to books, cookbooks, field guides, craft books, things like that. So the thing that I would like you to think about is do you have a rich assortment of nonfiction books in your, uh, in your library or in your classroom book collection? And do you, when you're doing instruction, do you include plenty of nonfiction in read-alouds, in book talks, in mentor texts? And I think the reason that we really need to examine this is because many people who tend to go to be either children's librarians or um, literacy educators tend to gravitate toward narrative writing. They love stories and storytellings, storytelling, and it can be kind of hard for them to understand that there are children who think differently, that there are, you know, some people call them info kids that really they really connect strongly to ideas and information and data and statistics. And if we really want them to learn to thrive as readers and to fall in love with reading, we need to give them access to books that they are going to fall in love with. And um, so my question for you is, if you go back and look at your library collection, does it include a rich, diverse assortment of nonfiction books in all five categories? And if it doesn't, how can you start to change that? Have some really good information down in the description below. You can find where to follow Melissa on Twitter, follow her blog. I have some links down below if you want to pur purchase uh, three of my favorite Melissa Stewart books. So check that stuff out down below. Thank you so much, Melissa. You are amazing. Looking at my library, I noticed that we had a lot of narrative nonfiction. Very, very heavy. I would say almost half of our nonfiction part of our library is narrative nonfiction, and we also have a lot of expository text, but we need to really think hard about finding some of those other types and broadening that range because some of the types that we're kind of weak on, those are the types that my kids really want to read. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment below. Answer Melissa's question. What can you do to make sure that your classroom has a wide range of nonfiction text? Thank you so much for watching. Have an awesome day. Happy, happy reading.